This video <clears throat> is a part of a series of uh, video lectures on hermeneutics by me. I'm Dr. Joe Sprinkle. And this is the third of the section on the history of interpretation. This particular video will be on uh, patristic exegesis. And it will trace how the allegorical method of interpretation or spiritualizing approach uh, came to be predominant during the Middle Ages. In the earliest centuries of Christianity, there developed two schools of thought about hermeneutics, one centered in Alexandria, Egypt, and the other in Antioch in Syria. One emphasized the allegorical method of interpretation. The other emphasized literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. So let me talk about the Alexandrian school first. The Alexandrian school, uh, they're developed in Alexandrian Egypt, uh, systemize Philo's allegorical method of interpreting the Bible. Now, when I called this the Alexandrian school, it was not a school in any formal sense, but refers to a set of ideas that were particularly associated with this region. And among the theologians associated with the Alexandrian school were students of the writing of Philo the Jew and uh, and were highly influenced by Philo's allegorical approach to reading the Bible. And the two most prominent theologians of this school were Clement of Alexandria, who died around 215 of the Christian era, and Origen, who died around 254. And Origen in particular was a especially influential theologian and scholar of the early church. And therefore his uh, defense of the allegorical interpretation was especially influential. The concern of the Alexandrian school was, well, how do we read the Old Testament as a Christian? That would be the reason why uh, the Alexandrian school took up Philo's allegorical method. For Philo, the issue was, how can we reconcile the Bible with Neoplatonism? The theologians of the Alexandrian school were concerned about something else. For them, the issue was, how can we save the Old Testament for the Christian? Because taken literally, much of the Old Testament seemed irrelevant or still worse, contrary to Christian doctrine and ideals. The solution proposed by these Alexandrian theologians was to assume that the New Testament teaching is in the Old Testament in a concealed manner. The method for discerning this concealed New Testament teaching is the allegorical method. But once the method was accepted as valid, it also opened the door for finding allegorical meanings throughout Scripture. And so let me give you a couple of examples of how uh, one might uh, do allegorizing of uh, things uh, according to the Alexandrian school. Uh, the Alexandrian school took the uh, feeding of the 5,000 uh, from Matthew chapter 14, 13 through 21. And uh, there you have five loaves and two fish that Jesus took to feed the 5,000 in that uh, miracle. And some in the Alexandrian school saw an allegory in this. The five loaves reminded them of the five books of the law, the Pentateuch. And just as ancient bread was dry and coarse, so is the law. But the two fish stand for the gospel. As fish are more tender, juicy, and tasty than loaves of bread, so the gospel is more satisfying than the law. Uh, 
Now, of course, the problem with this whole line of interpretation is that there's absolutely nothing in the context to suggest that this was meant to be an allegory. It was St. Hilary that uh, preached a version of this allegory, if you uh, wanted to chase it down in, uh, uh, you can see in uh, Manlio uh, Simonetti edited uh, Matthew 14 through 28 in the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, uh, published by Downers Grove InterVarsity 2002, if you want to chase the details down. Another place where they uh, applied this allegorical interpretation was the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, you have uh, uh, in, in that, that parable, uh, Jesus tells us that a man was beaten by robbers, but was helped by a Good Samaritan. And uh, this was all an answer to a lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? And many have seen in this story an allegory of Christ. And so when it says a certain man, uh, well, that certain man means Adam or the poor lost sinner. And that certain man fell among thieves. The thieves would represent the devil and his angels. And they stripped him of his clothing, means they removed his virtue and purity. But then a priest came along, and then a Levite, both of whom passed him by. That stands for the law and the prophets that cannot save. But then a Samaritan came by and took pity on him. The Samaritan stands for Christ, who can save. And they bandaged up his wounds, pouring on uh, oil and wine. Uh, which means that Christ helps the poor law sinner, healing him with the Holy Spirit, which the oil stands for, and his blood, which the wine stands for. And then uh, it says that he set him on his own animal, which uh, either refers to God's guardian angels or to the body of Christ. And he brought him to the inn, which in at least one version of this uh, 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 allegory means he took him to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, again, the problem of this allegory is that it violates the context. The allegory does not answer the question of the lawyer that brought on the statement of this parable, who is my neighbor? But the allegorical view sees hidden meanings regardless of the context. That's the way allegorical interpretation tends to work. So what are we to make of allegorical interpretations? There are some arguments in favor of allegorizing. For example, one could argue that the Bible as a supernatural book uh, could be expected to be divinely encoded with secret uh, meanings. And there's books out there like the Bible Code that tried to find uh, secret meanings uh, hidden in the text. The New Testament does uh, have an allegory that's kind of similar, uh, or something that's kind of similar to uh, allegory. Uh, you have that in uh, Galatians chapter uh, 4, verses uh, 21 through uh, 31 where Paul seems to allegorize the story of Sarah and Hagar, where he says that Hagar stands for the covenant at Mount Sinai and the law centered in Jerusalem, and Sarah stands for the heavenly Jerusalem. And you might argue, well, if Paul interpreted the Bible allegorically, well, why shouldn't we be able to interpret the Bible allegorically? And the allegorists often quoted from 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, uh, where it says, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And what they took that to mean was that the letter, meaning literal interpretation, kills, but the spirit, spiritualizing interpretation, allegorical interpretation, uh, gives life. It makes the text more meaningful and lively, you might say. But then there are arguments against allegorizing. Uh, 
Uh, the main argument is that it is subjective and very easily leads to eisegesis. The allegorical interpretation makes it nearly impossible to verify whether an interpretation is really valid. Allegorizing makes it easy to impose ideas onto the text that are not really there. As we saw in the case of Philo of Alexandria that read into the text his uh, Neoplatonic philosophy. In fact, almost any idea can be found in the text if one uses <clears throat> the allegorical method. The whole method is, opens the door wide for eisegesis, reading foreign ideas into the text. Uh, allegorizing, you might say, is kind of like looking at clouds. If you look at clouds long enough, you'll see pictures in the cloud. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll see uh, maybe a car or maybe uh, uh, an animal, a dog or a cat or something. Even though this is just a trick of your mind rather than something that's really there. So the mind will trick us into seeing what is not there if we uh, adopt this allegorical type interpretation. But then what about Paul's allegorizing in Galatians chapter 4, 21 through 31? Well, one might argue that this is a ad hominem argument rather than an argument justifying allegorizing. While it's true that Paul employs allegory in Galatians 4, uh, this may not justify the method. Galatians 4 is, only, is the only case of allegorizing in the New Testament, and in this particular case, Paul may be employing a technique used by his Judaizing opponents in order to argue against them. In other words, the Judaizers, with their midrashic and allegorical exegesis, uh, defended their views uh, of the law being central to uh, uh, the Christian life and uh, without keeping the law, you can't be saved. So Paul uses their own method, allegorizing, to prove the inferiority of the law and the need to expel it. And perhaps Paul is saying, in effect, if you want that kind of interpretation, well, here it is. Uh, Lisa, that's the argument that Bernard Ram and his Protestant biblical interpretation makes. Now, as opposed to the uh, Alexandrian school, there was another school of thought that uh, centered around Antioch in Syria. And this school, established at the end of the third, third century AD, uh, uh, opposed the allegorical method defended by the Alexandrian school. Uh, the most uh, prominent theologian and scholar of the Antioch school was Theodore of Mopsustia, a fifth century bishop of Antioch. Theodore rejected the Alexandrian allegorical practices and, quote, any interpretation that denies the historical reality of what the biblical text records, quote, unquote. The allegorical school fought the allegorical method of origin and maintained the primacy of the literal interpretation of scripture, that is, its grammatical and historical meaning, as opposed to finding hidden mystical meanings. And so they maintained uh, the primacy of literal interpretation of, scriptural, uh, of scripture. Uh, again, that's literal as opposed to allegorical. Not that there are no metaphors or figurative language in scripture, but it's as opposed to this allegorizing and spiritualizing of the text. Well, unfortunately, uh, the Antioch school lost out in uh, the intermediate run. Uh, this was in part because heresy undermined the authority of the Alexandrian school. In particular, uh, a certain Nestorius, uh, a fifth century theologian who was a student of Theodore of uh, Antioch, uh, said that in Christ there were two persons, one God and another man, uh, which was contrary, by the way, to uh, Theodore's more orthodox teaching. Uh, 
uh, but because uh, this heretical idea came out of, out of the Alexandrian school, that served to discredit that school in the minds of the broader church. It is interesting to note that the literal interpreters of Antioch were more often to become unorthodox or heretical than the allegorical interpreters. Literal interpreters were more willing to judge tradition by scripture and uh, uh, lean, their own, uh, lean on their own uh, rational understanding of scripture rather than depending on the church's tradition to reach their conclusion. They thus uh, gave themselves more liberty, intellectually speaking, to explore non-orthodox ideas. Allegorists, on the other hand, began with the orthodox tradition and read into that their allegories. So even though the allegorical interpretations were illegitimate exegetically, uh, they were nonetheless usually orthodox uh, in doctrine. Well, that brings us then to interpretation in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there was a triumph of the spiritualizing or allegorizing approach to interpretation. In the Middle Ages, mysticism prevailed. Uh, the purpose of studying the Bible in uh, the view of these uh, uh, people was less to learn facts than to have a mystical union with the divine. And allegorizing was seen as a uh, means of assisting them to achieve a mystical union with Christ. In fact, they allegorize scripture in a very systematic way. You'd look at a text and you would look at the letter of the text, literal meaning, the allegorical meaning, what they call the tropological meaning, and the anagological uh, meaning. And uh, uh, this is uh, how it uh, reads. Um, there's a little poem that helps uh, people remember the system. Uh, the letter shows us what God and our fathers did. The allegory shows us where our faith is hid. In other words, they read the New Testament into the Old Testament. Uh, the moral uh, is, uh, meaning gives us rules of daily life. Uh, the anagogy, uh, which has to do with eschatology, shows us where we will end our strife. And indeed, there is a Latin version of this poem that's a little more concise. And uh, since my Latin is uh, pretty much non-existent, I will not bother to read it to you, but you could Google it and you could probably find it uh, easily enough. Uh, but uh, basically you looked at the letter of the text, what it literally said, the allegory or the typology that uh, finds uh, hidden symbolic meanings. You look at it in a moral way or tropological way, uh, uh, tropologic means how you live your daily life, uh, has to do with life. And then uh, the anagogy uh, has to do with the uh, end times, uh, particularly, uh, you know, life after death, where we end our strife. Now, the classical example of this is the interpretation of the, of the word Jerusalem, where it happens to occur in a text. So if you happen to be reading Psalm 122 and verse 6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We well, could read it literally. Uh, pray for Jerusalem, which is a city in Jerusalem, in, in Judah. Uh, you can read it in an allegorical way, where Jerusalem allegorically means the church. So pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem would then mean pray for the peace of God's church. But then there's the tropological meaning. The tropological meaning of Jerusalem is the human soul. So pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem would mean pray for the peace of the human soul. But then the anagological meaning of Jerusalem, as we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, uh, the new Jerusalem is heaven itself. And so pray 
for heaven's peace or pray uh, for the peace of heaven. Um, and so every text where Jerusalem occurs, you would think about it these you know, four different ways, literally, allegorically, tropologically, and anagologically. And that's the uh, systematic way in which uh, in the Middle Ages, they came to analyze uh, and look at the Bible in this uh, systemized, uh, spiritualizing approach. Now, it turns out uh, that uh, according to that system, it, it wasn't that one or another of those interpretations was right. Uh, they were all right at the same time. And this kind of mysticism and uh, spiritualizing wasn't limited to the church. It was also happening in Judaism. <clears throat> in Judaism, you have a movement called the Kabbalah movement, uh, which is mystical Judaism. And it sought to find esoteric insights into the divine nature. And there are various uh, techniques in which they uh, did this sort of thing. Uh, the Kabbalists sought to, to examine scripture on the assumption that every letter of the Bible has a numerical value. And one mystical technique used by Kabbalist Jews uh, assume that the numerical value of words in the Bible have great significance. And so playing with the numerical value of words uh, was, uh, uh, was a game that they played, and that was called gematria. Again, they suppose that words in the Bible, each letter has a numerical value, and every word, you'd add up the letters, and you'd get a value, and that it was supposed to have some sort of significance. So, for example, if you uh, were looking at Genesis 15 and verse 2, uh, Abraham had a servant by the name of Eliezer. And if you take the uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet, um, and each letter has a numerical value, Aleph is 1, Bet is 2, Gimel is 3, Yod is 10, um, and on down the list. Well, anyway, the numerical value of the name Eliezer is 318. But then it says in Genesis uh, 14 and verse 4 that the number of Abraham's uh, trained men who joined him to try to uh, win back Lot from uh, kings of the east who had kidnapped him, uh, that number was 318. And so what does it teach us that Eliezer's name is a numerical value of 318 and uh, Abraham's servants, uh, uh, trained men, were 318? And they would say it has a deep significance. What it says is that Eliezer alone was worth a host of servants. And so that's the kind of game that they, uh, they were playing. And again, there are uh, uh, people that have played this game. Uh, uh, the Bible Code I mentioned before, they played that kind of game too. Some Christians have uh, played the game as well. I know when I taught at Toccoa Falls College, uh, some of our students did some evangelism in uh, an area of Atlanta where there was a, a Orthodox a Jewish population, some of whom were Kabbalists. And they argued against Jesus by saying that the numerical value of the name Jesus in Hebrew is the same as the numerical value of Satan in Hebrew. And therefore, Jesus is equivalent uh, to Satan. And so, uh, you know, you can play all kinds of games with, uh, with this uh, methodology. Uh, but the problem, of course, is does the Bible really teach us that uh, there's numerical value of words in the Bible and that that has any significance at all? Uh, the answer is probably it has no significance whatsoever. But um, the Kabbalists uh, assume that it did, and uh, some Christians have played that game as well. That's gematria. Now, in contrast to uh, these tendencies of allegorizing in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, there was a survival of literal inter interpretation in the Middle Ages as well. 
uh, in the church. Uh, that uh, more literal interpretation was uh, influenced by uh, a group of uh, Christians known as the Victorines. Uh, they were members of the Abbey of Saint Victor in Paris, and they uh, flourished around AD uh, 1100. Uh, they were influenced by uh, the more literal branch of uh, Jewish scholarship, and they learned to interpret the Bible relatively literally, primarily a literal inter uh, hermeneutic in the interpretation of the Bible, as opposed to this allegorical spiritualizing interpretation of uh, the Bible. In the Eastern Church, uh, the more literal hermeneutic continued to be taught in the Mesopotamian Christian centers of Edessa and uh, uh, Nisibis, uh, cities just north of what is now the southern border of Turkey. And there the hermeneutical tradition of the Antioch school uh, carried on. There was also uh, in the church a certain Jew by the name of Nicholas of Lyra who converted to Christianity. You can see his dates uh, around 1270 to 1340. Uh, he became a Fran Franciscan and was the greatest Christian Hebrew exegete of his day because he converted having already uh, studied Hebrew. And uh, one of the things he was known for was that he argued for the very strongly in favor of the literal as opposed to the allegorical uh, method of interpretation of scripture. And his case for uh, literal interpretation had influence on the Protestant Reformation because Martin Luther read and accepted his arguments. Indeed, uh, someone has said that if uh, Lyra, referring to Nicholas of Lyra, if Lyra had not piped, Luther would not have danced. Nicholas himself puts it this way, one should also understand that the literal sense of the text has been much obscured because of the manner of expounding of the text commonly handed down by others. Although they have said much that is good, yet they have been inadequate in their treatment of the literal sense and have so multiplied the number of mystical senses that the literal sense is in some part cut off and suffocated among so many mystical senses. They confuse both the mind and the memory of the reader and distract it from understanding the literal meaning of the text. There were also uh, still a branch of uh, Jewish interpretation that uh, avoided Kabbalistic spiritualizing, were not overly midrashic, uh, and uh, these uh, were more literal-oriented exegetes of uh, the Bible. Um, and uh, again, some of these influence uh, uh, the Victorines, as we mentioned. Um, and two prominent grammatical historical exegesis include, includes uh, Rashi, uh, a late uh, 11th century uh, uh, Jewish scholar. Rashi is short for Rabbi uh, Shlomo ben uh, Yitzhak, uh, Rabbi Solomon, son of Isaac, um, and that's shortened to uh, Rashi. Uh, there was also Ibn Ezra, uh, who was a Jew that lived in um, Arabic-speaking North Africa. Uh, both uh, Rashi and Ibn Ezra were proponents of a more grammatical historical rather than midrashic exegesis, and their commentaries are still uh, consultable today. Well, in short, during the Middle Ages, that was the heyday of the spiritualizing the approach, the allegorical approach to interpreting uh, the Bible. But uh, the trend towards a more grammatical historical exegesis was already there among the Jews who came to influence uh, the Abbey of St. Victor and Nicholas of Lyra, 
all of whom would influence the Reformation and the Reformers, uh, and uh, uh, who will adopt a more literal rather than allegorical approach to interpreting uh, the Bible. So uh, this is my uh, uh, presentation on uh, the uh, interpretation during the Middle Ages. And um, my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.